Hey, good morning. At the beginning of our service, if you came in a few minutes late, we spent some time praying uh, for those in the aftermath of the storm, especially our neighbors to the east of us and the counties close by, those rural counties that really did uh, take the storm very hard, as well as those in western North Carolina, east Tennessee, that region. And I just want to encourage you to keep praying. Uh, thankfully, the churches we partner with and the organizations we partner with financially and prayerfully are already on the ground in those areas doing great work, especially in North Carolina. And we want to make sure we continue to remember them. We give generously uh, to the work that's happening. This is our last week in a series called The Work. We're looking at the fact that God has work for us to do as Christians. We're forgiven of our sins by grace, not our efforts, the efforts of Jesus, but God has work now for us to do. And this last week, we're going to talk about the work of continuing to become a very hopeful people. The work of being a hopeful people and how that can impact our community as we go, let's go together from our church for the city and to the world. We want to impact Tallahassee by being people who have a clear and certain hope that is not a hope on circumstances, not a hope that's fragile, not a hope that's dependent on anyone else except for Jesus and his work on the cross. What a difference it makes for our city that's so needing of hope to see a hopeful people called the Church of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together and we'll jump in. Our Father, we still are mindful this morning of those in the aftermath of the storm. And Lord, the one who can calm the waves, who is over all things sovereign, Lord, we ask that you will give those people relief and recovery and you be with the believers on the ground of providing hope, providing physical needs, spiritual needs. Lord, we lift them up to you, especially in North Carolina right now in East Tennessee in that amazing area of the country. Lord, we ask uh, for healing to take place and for it to continue. Please continue to put it on our minds that we have your ear and that in your sovereignty, you allow prayer to be what you use uh, to carry out your will. However that works, there's mystery to it, but we do know that we have your ear and that you are sovereign and that you are in control. So look to our God this morning. Lord, I ask for our city uh, that we, as uh, we were spared much from the hurricane, uh, that we'll be mindful of our neighbors and quick to help if there's need around us and that we will be a generous people to help those uh, who are in need of recovery right now. Lord, I ask you to speak through me this morning to keep the enemy out of this place, out of our church, that we will be found faithful, uh, that we will be able to go forward as people of hope because we believe that Jesus Christ has risen from the grave, that the tomb is empty, that our salvation has been accomplished. Lord, I ask you to all the churches in Tallahassee as they gather today, let us all be convinced of the good news of the gospel. Let us all believe that in Christ alone, our hope is found. We don't preach random morals for the sake of morals. We preach Jesus Christ and the work we have for us to do in response to what you have done for us. So we depend on you. I ask you to speak to me again this morning. I ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Romans chapter 5, where we'll begin today. Romans chapter 5, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. I think I say that a lot, but I have a lot of favorite chapters in the Bible. This is definitely one of them. It ranks pretty high in my top 25 list. So here we go. Verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, meaning God has declared us not guilty of our sins, even though we've sinned a lot. God declares us not guilty because Jesus, who never sinned, was found guilty in our place through his death on the cross. Because that is true, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If it wasn't true, if we haven't been justified, we certainly do not have peace with God. We have hostility with God because we're sinners in rebellion against him, but no, not us, not Christians. We have peace with God because we've been justified. And if you're new to faith, checking out Christianity, you need to know this. You can have peace with God by trusting in Jesus to actually be your justification rather than yourself. We have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, we also have obtained access through him by faith. Again, not by our works. It's all by the work of Christ and to this grace in which we stand. We bank all our hope on our justification, that Jesus is the one he claimed to be, and he accomplished this work for us. And we boast in the hope. That's where we boast. Not in ourselves, not generically in lowercase g, God. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. And what is that hope? It's verse one, that we have our justification, that God has accomplished this for us. He goes, and I'm gonna keep going, verse three. He says, and not only that, and this sounds so strange, unless verse one is true. One of the weirdest things you'll ever read that is complete foolishness to the world, unless verse one is true. We also boast in our afflictions. What dumb messaging to the world when they first hear it in their eyes? Because our world is always get rid of afflictions any way possible, and there's always some sort of other reason for it. He is not Christians. 
And he's not saying we want affliction to come our way. He says, because our hope really is grounded in Christ, we can boast in anything if it's for the glory of God, including. So they're probably saying, well, what about struggles? What about trials? I knew you were going to ask that. And Paul says, and not only that, we also boast in our afflictions because we know. We have a certain hope. We know how this plays out. So in the meantime, uh, that we know that affliction produces endurance in us. It grows us in our faith. Endurance produces proven character that's been tried, that's been tested. And what does that proven character keep doing for us? It produces hope. And this hope will not disappoint us. How often do we put hope in somewhere or someone and find ourselves to be disappointed? If you're putting your hope in the upcoming election, no matter who wins, I promise you, you will be disappointed. This hope will not disappoint us. Why? Because God's love, not the world's love, that's conditional. God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, here's how God loves us. While we were helpless at the right time in God's sovereignty, as he planned, Christ died for the ungodly. Count yourself in that. That's us. When Jesus said he's a friend of sinners, he's talking about us. Christ died for the ungodly. He says here, let's get real practical, verse seven. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. He's saying you have a very short list of people you'd die for. A very short list. Probably really close family. Cousins probably don't make the cut. Your spouse, your children. A very, very short list of people you would die for. And he goes, of course not. I mean, of course you do. He goes, but here's how God is. God proves, not just feels, even though he does, not just tells us, even though he does, he proves his own love for us. And that while we were sinners, not after we cleaned up, not after we contributed something, not after we let go and let God, not even after we got to work, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Never let that be elementary, just the ABCs of Christianity to you. Let it be A through Z that excites you about the whole story and reminds you of God's grace in your life. How much more then, because of all the things I just told you, because we've now been justified by his blood, that's how it happens, we will be saved through him from wrath. That's what's happened, that's past tense, we've been saved. For if we were enemies, we were recon- while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, now that we've been saved, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? When we were enemies of God, he died for us, now we're his friends. How much can we trust in God now that we're one with him and reconciled to him? And not only that, but we also boast in God. He's the source. He's the one. He's the object of our worship through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. What a chapter of the Bible. The gospel, this good news that he just described, it gives us hope. In a stressed out, unsure, defeated, anxious restless, and on-edge mission field that is all around us, desperately needs hope. And we also need hope as well. And we must do the work of reminding ourselves we actually already have it. See, human beings by nature, we desperately need hope. And not just that, we need a true hope, a certain hope. Why? Because people crave it, and God has provided it for us. Seems like every election cycle, the trademark or the the saying, the branding is hope. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Hope here. Hope there. And the whole idea is that these politicians, and I'm thankful for politicians, they give their life to this work to serve our neighbors and our nation, but that they're the ones that are going to bring hope. And the question we have to ask is, hope in what? Hope in what? And then if it's hope is found in them, then what happens when your candidate loses? Or isn't in office anymore? 
is hope gone? Has hope left us? Has hope gone away? But it's difficult for us to hold on to a true hope, and it does look foolish to the world. Why? Erwin Inth says this, that Christian hope seems unreasonable because very often we will not experience victory in this life. And how often do we want results instantly? I know I do. We want a microwave life, not a crockpot life. Immediately, now. And we're hoping for something yet to come, and the world's going, what's that doing for you right this second? And our response has to be, it's doing much for me right this second. Because I know what's promised to me, and I can patiently wait for it to come true. My ultimate forever salvation, living out my oneness with Jesus Christ. And Paul owns this, the strangeness of it. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19, he says this, if we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, just to kind of give us a boost and a little moral you know, thrust and allows us to you know, just kind of have some good spiritual feels when things go wrong, then, then we should be pitied more than anyone. At least they're getting instant tangible results from their hope, the world, at least for a moment. It's going to disappear, it's going to go away, but at least they can pretend for a while. But what about us? We're banking on forever, and if our hope is only now, then why would we be people who take on persecution and say yes to God and no to the things of this world? Like, why would we do that? If our hope's for this life only, then go eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow you die. Like, go do whatever you want to do. But if it is eternal, it really does count right this moment. Then he summarizes that hope, and in verses 57 through 58, he lands the plane, and he says, but thanks be to God. Yeah, it's going to come later, but it's also right now, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Sin has been defeated. Death has been conquered. He says, therefore, because we have this victory, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast. Be immovable. Culture changes every minute. Be immovable. Stubbornly immovable, not stuck in your ways, planted in the scriptures, always excelling in the Lord's work. There's a work for us to do because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Folks, you're not wasting your time in following Jesus. It is not in vain. The goal of our lives, not just to get to retirement, it's so much greater. There's a hope that we do. And when you get to retirement, wonderful. Guess what? God wants you to keep working for his glory. It's just going to look different and be carried out in different ways. So we work to be people who live out the certain hope we have. It's not just a private, tucked away in the back of our mind kind of idea. In a broken world, we await Christ to fulfill the final hope, our ultimate restoration. And it is difficult to stay mindful of God's promises. I know it is. It is for me. It's difficult to stay hopeful. As different things come your way, and imagine being people in North Carolina right now trying to remain hopeful. But again, what is the hope? See, Christians are people, we could call it in the in-between. Theologians refer to it as being already, not yet. As we already have all the promises of God, fill, the one day will officially be realized and consummated when Christ returns. But we live in that tension. We already know the truth that Jesus has risen from the grave, that he's coming again, but we await for it in the in-between. You could say that we feel that tension kind of like a long-distance relationship between an engaged couple. And don't be mistaken, God is near right now. But oftentimes, I was, when Christy and I were, dating, were engaged, we were long distance the entire time. I was at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. She was in Tallahassee at Florida State. And it was like, good grief, can we finally just be together? You have this longing the bride often does to, to be with your groom, especially when you're engaged to me, major longing. And I'm around engaged couples a lot, premarital counseling, doing their weddings. I, I love all those things. And you, you, kind of a common thing to say to the bride is, you ready? Like, you know, two months out, are you ready? And they've done all this planning, and then they eventually go, you know what, and they, every single time it's the same script. You know what, I'm just ready to be married. After a 10-month engagement, you odd birds that do two-year engagements, six-month engagements, towards the end it's like, I'm just ready to be married. 
See, we are called the bride of Christ. That's already true of us now. But we could say we're living in a very long engagement season. And there one day will be a true marriage where the bride and groom are together for all eternity. It's already true. We are the bride of Christ. Scripture calls us that. But we're awaiting that ultimate wedding to take place. Here's what Paul says to the Romans, chapter 8. Now in this hope, the hope we read about in Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, all of this. Now in this hope we were saved. It's already happened. But hope that is seen, it's not hope. Because who hopes for what he sees? It's not a hope, that's just right in front of you. I appreciate that he acknowledges that. Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. The Bible points us back there over and over again. And keep in mind, the Old Testament is a story of generations and generations of awaiting the Messiah's first coming that we call the Advent. Now here we are waiting for Christ's second coming. In other words, we're not the first Christians to wait and to be called to be patient and to bank our lives on promises and hope. So we feel the tension, and maybe you haven't realized that's what it is, a little angst in you, trying to follow Jesus or the world pulls another way, wondering if it's worth it, being discouraged regularly by the things of this world, by aging, by things not working out exactly as you thought they would. It really is a longing. And the temptation is to fill it with the things of this world. That's not profound at all, that's just reality. Like that's the temptation, rather than to fill with hope. The Gospel Coalition wrote an article about Augustine, the early church leader and writer, who described this tension of two cities, the city of God and the city of man. And by city of man, he basically means this world, its values, its beliefs, its loyalties, its priorities, its ideologies. Rather than the city of God that's eternally minded, living for Jesus in the here and now and the in-between and the already not yet. And Augustine says the two cities were created, so these metaphorical cities, by two kinds of love. The earthly city, the city of man, was created by self-love, reaching the point of contempt for God. The earthly city glorifies in itself. The heavenly city glorifies in the Lord. See, we are living in the earthly city while waiting and longing for the eternal city, but doing the work as if it's already here. The earthly city is so fragile. And you know what it does as a result? It creates extremely fragile people. This is an article from Pete Nicola who summarizes the book Anti-Fragile uh, by Nassim Talib who observes that some objects are naturally fragile, like glass or fine china, that expensive wedding gift you've got that you've used one time in your 26 years of marriage. And some are naturally resilient, like rubber, Tupperware. There's another category he labels as anti-fragile. Anti-fragile. And just as the immune system becomes stronger when exposed to the normal circulation of viruses and bacteria, so some objects become better under stress. And that's how God views us. As people he's forming in the midst of so much darkness and brokenness. Because for the Christian, the gospel gives a unique security it really is a unique security. It allows us to be anti-fragile in a fragile world. N now, this does not mean that we are cold or we are numb or we are unable to feel. Jesus had emotions. Jesus felt deeply. He was fully God and fully man. But we're anti-fragile. And that plays out in how we see the past, how we see the present, and how we see the future. It's popular today to collect old vinyl records. They've kind of made somewhat of a comeback. But one thing about an old record is it can get scratched. And the scratch, it's so annoying. It makes the record jump and skip, and it, it keeps skipping and repeating uh, that section where the scratch is located. 
unable to move to the rest of the song. And the things in our past can be like scratches on a record. Our memories get stuck. We get planted there. And you can't move on in grace to the rest of your new life in Christ. But here's the good news for us. Our peace in Christ fills the scratch. He is the one that fills it in and allows us to move from our past to our present, mindful of the future. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, that at the cross, where we've been justified, our sins have been thrown away into the sea of God's forgetfulness. Isn't that great news? Our sins have been thrown away into the seas of God's forgetfulness. Why? Because Jesus took them upon himself. So what's the answer to hope from our past? For our past, it's a forward-facing faith. Looking back at our old life, outside of it producing gratitude in us for what God's done and how he saved us is not the posture of the Christian. We don't look to the past, we look forward to what Christ has already done and what he's promised to continue doing. What does it look like to be hopeful people in the present? It's an upward-minded faith. See, maturing, growing, anti-fragile Christians are eternally-minded people. We are eternally-minded. We're aware this earth is not it. As bad as it may seem in your life at certain moments, and Jesus is not telling you to pretend it's fine, we are a certain hopeful people that realize that the worst it's ever going to get is this side of heaven. The worst it's ever going to get. That is not when we go hide in our room and turn the lights off the rest of our lives. No, God wants us to live in that hope, live in that reality, but having an upward-minded faith. So the way we're freed from our past in terms of living out what's already been done for us in Jesus is a forward-facing faith. In the present, it's an upward-minded faith. And in the future, it's going to be a fully realized hope. A fully realized hope. So we are an upward people and we are a forward people. 2 Corinthians 4, for we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you, that Christ's resurrection assures ours. Indeed, everything is for your benefit. Like God's really doing a work in you and it's not random. So as grace extends through more and more people, it may cause thanksgiving to increase to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not give up. Like tapping out is not an option for a Christian. We do not give up. Even though we acknowledge this broken world, our outer person is being destroyed. But even though that's reality, guess what God's doing inside of you? Our inner person is being renewed day by day. God's growing you and guiding you and leading you in the work he calls you to do. For our momentary light affliction, now the comparison here is to what's waiting for us in heaven. He's not saying that what happened to you is light. He's saying compared to heaven, here's the mindset we have to have. Our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. It's making us mindful. It's focusing us there. It's giving us a certain hope. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. How badly does our world need to hear this? But what is unseen is eternal. He's saying, hope in the world? Like, why would you do that? Yes, live here and flourish here and raise your family here and provide here and, and do the, the things that God's brought you here to do for his glory, but don't put your hope here. And this work series has been the context of reminding us of why we did Let's Go, our two-year vision of expanding our vision to go from our church for the city into the world. And I am convinced that as we are care about the next generation, compare about, care about everybody who's here right now, that we have to make sure people are seen, not just folks who believe that Jesus died and rose again, but what are the implications of that for the here and now? Yes, we're forgiven, that's the biggest story, and that's so important. 
but now we can shine a light, not in the cliche way, but as a hopeful people in a dark world where people in Tallahassee can say, there's just something different about the folks that go to that church. They're not afraid. They're unwavering on the scriptures. I've known the tragedies they've gone through and they still hold fast to their beliefs, even in their pain. They're patient. They've prayed for their son to get baptized for 15 years. They're patient, and they're committed to Christ and his church. Our hope in the gospel brings peace with God. It defeats death, and it enables us to endure hardships that will last. And Paul says this, for we know, and I love the confidence. And why does he know these things? He's so convinced of it all because Easter is real, because Jesus rose from the grave. For we know that if our earthly tent we live in is destroyed, our bodies, our stuff, we have a building from God. We're looking to a greater building, a greater temple. And it's an eternal dwelling in the heavens, and guess what? It's not made with hands. It's not made with hands. So in the Old Testament, when God confronts idolatry through the prophets, they're building statues and worshiping them, and God actually mocks them. And he says, let's get this straight. You went to Home Depot. I've never been before. I'm, I'm in Dorsey, so tell me about it sometime, but... You, go, you went to Home Depot, you bought stuff, you bought wood and nails and all the things, and you went home and you built a structure, and maybe you colored on it and put some eyes and a nose and, and a face, and now all you folks are gathering around and you're worshiping it. He's like, you know, that thing has ears but can't hear. It has eyes that you drew on it but can't see. It has a mouth. You know that. You painted it. It can't speak. So think about what you're doing for a minute. You're putting your hope in things that you built. Like you actually took this stuff and constructed it, and now you're saying that that's a god? It's made by human hands, but you have a promise waiting for you that's in the heavens. And not only is it not made with hands, it's made by the eternal God. Let's put our hope there. And let's show a city by how we handle every area of our lives that Christianity is not a category. It's not an accessory, it's not an add-on. I know maybe, maybe you're new to faith, or maybe new to church, or maybe just new to Bible preaching church, whatever it could be, and, and I just want to encourage you, you're, you're going to keep growing in that. You're going to keep growing in that. We're not, we're not expected to be you know, zero to 100 Christians in 10 seconds. There's not a 100 Christian in this room. We're all in the process of growing, understanding, learning, and believing more that God really is best. And we have to go around him for the things we're looking for. We can go right to him and that I not, don't have more to be gained by disobeying him than I do to be gained by obeying him. That's a lifelong journey in believing that. So let's be a hopeful people and a certain hope that is Christ. For our own souls, for the sake of our families, for the sake of your adult kids, for the sake of your grandchildren, for the sake of our, worker, our coworkers, our community, and for the world. When they look at us, they see people that aren't hopeful in ourselves, but are hopeful in Jesus, which means now we're free to get to work. To the glory of his name. Let's pray together.